What the heck is this? Furry beans with legs? I am so confused. Believe it or not, these creatures are wingless moths. And it's all natural. The females of these species actually do have wings. But they are so small you can hardly see them. Totally bizarre, isn't it? It's normal for this species of moth. Let me just show you its cycle in captivity, in one of my most unusual episodes so far of Moth Cycles. My online web series in which I show the life cycle of moths. Let's start the intro. This episode, as usual, starts with babies. These are extremely tiny caterpillars and babies of the scarce vapor moth, Telogurus recens. In captivity they can eat just about anything, but I chose to use sweet gum or liquid amber. And perhaps these tiny babies are going to be one of the strangest life cycles I've shown you so far. The first instars of this insect are hairy and rather reddish. I raised them in the plastic boxes I use for all my, all my caterpillar species. Vapor moths are super interesting. I believe about 100 species are documented to science. Although recently the genus Orgia was split into other genera like Telogurus. Some of them are common or even considered pests and others are super rare or hardly documented. They are all known as vapor moths. The vaporer babies grew bigger and bigger. Cute, huh? Time for a space upgrade. I'm lazy and use sweet gum for almost every species because I have many sweet gum trees. One thing that is clear to me, it's time to upgrade their house. So here I have a container. And here I have an empty monster energy can. Don't worry, I filled it with water, okay? There's not monster energy inside of it. With some sweet gum leaves. Now the sweet gum is a plant that you will see on my YouTube channel many times, because it's one of my favorite host plants to use for many types of insects. It seems to work. I should say many types of moths, not insects. But moths, caterpillars, oh, they love sweet gum. Just gotta put it inside there. And this cage is going to be their new home, in fact. So that's, that's the good news. And that's difficult to do with one hand because I'm holding a damn camera. I shouldn't do this. It's making it more awkward. Oh, it's working. It's also an amazing host plant though. If you want to raise moths, grow some sweet gum. I placed the sweet gum in a small insect cage. And then I took the caterpillars and released them in their cage. Just grab them gently and unload them into the branches. Easy peasy. And now they look like this. Steady progress. I enjoy raising vapor moths because often their larval forms are quite incredible looking. With colors you wouldn't expect. Telogurus recens is a species found in Europe where it feeds on heather but also plants like hawthorn, willow and many more. The caterpillars are very polyphagous. Polyphagous means eating many kinds of plants. I wish I ate more plants. I just eat trash and junk food all day, and a lot of sadness and loneliness. Thankfully YouTube gives me a false sense of validation. It's okay to be lonely in real life if you are popular online. And then I find what looks like the first cocoons. Wow, already? This early into the video? Well yeah, this species can grow very fast if you keep them warm. My giant silk moth videos can take ages, but sometimes these small species can grow way faster. However, it's typically the males that make cocoons first. Males of these species are way smaller than the females, so they tend to have a shorter development time as well. These caterpillars were not ready to cocoon. These are probably the females. Their time will come soon 
as long as I just keep munching on those delicious, fresh and moist sweet gum leaves. God, I wish somebody ate my moist leaf. The cocoons of these species you can just gently pull them off the cage walls if they properly pupated. Just pull them off with your grubby fingers. Finally, more cocoons. What's interesting is that the pupae of these species right here are striped, kind of like a wasp. I do wonder if that keeps the predators away. Regardless, it's quite interesting and pretty in some way. Gypsy and vapor moths and other relatives always have cool looking pupa. I place the pupa in a plastic container with paper tissue at the bottom. Make sure that the moths can climb up. When they come out of the pupa, they like to hang instead of sit on the floor. The pupal stage is short. In less than even three weeks, you can see the first moths come out. Yay, look at that. Our first baby is born. How cute. The males of the scarce vapor are beautiful. Tiny moths don't get enough credit. That's why I want more small species on my channel too. Their wingtips have beautiful rusty orange patches on them and the rest of their wings is more convincingly marmored brown with white lines. In the corner of their forewing they have a bright white dot. The outer edges of their wings also have hairy frills and the males have big antennae. Unfortunately these small moths cannot feed and they only live for a few days. Because they cannot eat, they are essentially doomed to starve to death in about 3 to five day, 4 to 5 days time. A very short life. Before you know it, I had a whole bunch of single males, but no females for them. Sorry boys, you need some patience. But then it finally happened. Females were coming out of their pupa. The female of this species is extreme. She barely has any wings at all. Her wings have been reduced to stumps. This is known as brachypterism. It happens in many types of moth, including but not limited to this species. Did you know that there are even emperor moths or saturnidae species of which the females have reduced wings? One example is Meroleuca. There they are. These are potentially some of the world's silliest animals if you ask me. Literally beans with legs. These creatures are like 90% ass. The females of this moth are basically a bulging walking abdomen filled with eggs. They are so heavy they can barely even walk. So basically me in a few years, if I can keep drinking so much energy drinks, they've ruined my health. In the wild, females rarely even walk. They just sit on top of their cocoons and wait for a male to arrive. And when he does, they copulate and she lays hundreds and hundreds of eggs at once. In captivity, pairing them is extremely easy. Just put them together in a cage with some airflow, preferably made of netting. Unlike other moths on my channel, this piece of moth actually flies during the day to appreciate light and some warmth. This is what a pairing looks like. The male and female here are coupled up. This can last several hours. Important is not to disturb them during this process. I know that in some of my YouTube videos, I touch moths that are pairing. In reality, this is not a good idea. It can disturb the pairing, but today I let them finish their business. It's honestly the nice thing to do. After pairing, the female will kind of deflate like a balloon, laying a ridiculous mountain of eggs for such a tiny moth. Oh, and they cover them with body hairs too, so the eggs are protected from enemies. After a while, I kind of had a nice and active moth army, busy making children for me. A beautiful result. Despite that, the joy doesn't last very long. Their lifespans are way shorter than a week. It's crazy how much effort I make for creatures that live such a short time, honestly. Look at that, so many eggs. What do we do with all these eggs the females are laying for us, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we must incubate them. I collected them in a petri dish, which is an excellent place to incubate them, usually in about two weeks on room temperature. Wow, look at that. That's a ton of eggs, don't you agree? 
How interesting. And guess what? Surely two weeks later? Many of the babies came out. Mission complete. The end. Wow, shortest Moth Cycles episode ever. Yeah, I guess so. Or not. I've decided to breed two generations in one episode simply because I am the sexy Moth King, world's sexiest entomologist here to entertain you. So once again, I put the babies of the moths in small plastic boxes in order to rear them. Are you ready to watch another short life cycle of the same insect you've already just watched? Um, of course. You are bored and you need distraction from your mundane life. That's why I'm here to be your friendship shimmer simulator. Don't think about your problems, think about me. Worship me. However, this time I decided to put the caterpillars in the cage almost straight away. Why? Well, I like experimenting with different setups and seeing the results. Maybe this is way easier than starting with plastic boxes. Ah, oh, look at them growing. Once again, generation number two is coming. I gave them some hawthorn and laurel cherry just to test if they like it. Yay for experimentation with animals. That's how you learn more about them. Who the hell makes these sound effects? <coughs> Oh, okay then. Carry on, I guess. So why am I putting two life cycles in one video? Well, Moth Cycles is a special series on my channel and I want the episodes to be very long for the most hardcore Moth fans. For casual viewers, I have short videos too. But these are long. Yes, long and hard. Fun fact, did you know I have something long and hard to show you as well at the moment? It's a kind of monster energy, you freaking pervert. Oh my god, they made a new flavor with butterflies on the can. No, I don't get paid to promote it. I just really had to show it off because I'm a fool who can't even be serious for a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt the show over the simple fact that Monster Energy has brought out a type of energy with butterflies on it. It's called Monster Energy Papillon. Oh my god. Oh my god. Wow, it's pretty good too. Peach flavor. That's what I'm tasting. Finally, I'm extra powerful because these two things have combined. Butterflies and moths and monster energy. Was this really necessary to put in my episode? The answer is yes, this is super important. This stuff is not out in the Netherlands yet, so I had to ship it all the way from America to my home. That's how sick I am. I'm a very sick person. The flavor is like peach. It may actually be one of my favorites so far. Not much to my surprise, the caterpillars look the same as my before. That's also because they're the same species. Literally. What did you expect? In the wild, this species overwinters as caterpillars, but their diapause seems to be facultative and not obligate. That means it's optional and only triggered by certain environmental circumstances. If you keep them warm and around room temperature, it's quite likely that you will be able to rear them continuously. These caterpillars seem to be able to eat almost anything, honestly. After a while of rearing generation 2, of course, they started pupating. Yay, finally! Another generation of beautiful little moths. There they are, more of our petty little babies. Yay, generation 2 is here. Enjoy some images of these beautiful little insects. Take a look at these females. Incredible, no? Brachypterism is so fascinating to me. Now you may know it's actually pretty common for moths, in particular short-lived moth species with vestigial mouth parts to conserve their energy. One of the ways to do it is to divide the effort involved when it comes to mating, in this case burdening the males with covering the distance between partners, or in less awkward language the males are tasked with partners locating each other while females tend to be more inactive. 
That's because females have different and difficult tasks of their own, which is surviving long enough to find a suitable place to lay eggs and find a partner. In emperor moths, leopard moths and many other species it's common for females to sit in the same place for days and only become active once she was fertilized by a male. But sometimes nature takes this role division to extreme length by reducing the female's wings completely, making her an egg laying machine. This believe it or not can be an evolutionary advantage since not having wings nor the muscle mass to support them means a smaller energy expenditure to support those body parts and a body planet allows for the optimal volume of egg laying. And that's it, a nice little moth cycles episode. Did you like it? This time a smaller species than usual. That was it for now. That sure was fun ladies and gentlemen. I raised two generations. What stupid sound. Ah, I raised two generations of the uh, moth we saw today, but I'm going to end the episode here because some of the caterpillars are growing extremely slowly. Maybe they are in hibernation mode. That's because they spent winter in captivity and some of them naturally hibernate. But also because I already showed you one generation and a second generation. So I think you get the point. I think you really do. Uh, plus, spring is coming, the sun is back. I need this cage for new species of butterflies and moths. So uh, this is where the episode ends. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Bye bye. Let's start the discussion. Telogurus resens, or formerly Orgia resens, is one of the many species of vapor moths across the world. This interesting little species deserves some of our attention today, so let's talk about it. This presentation uses copyrighted photos and illustrations, which I am allowed to do under the fair use law, which allows me to use these images in a transformative and educational way. This video is demonetized and I gain nothing from doing this and for non-commercial purposes the fair use law allows me to use these materials. Are you the photographer or the creator of one of the pictures I used in this presentation? Then please understand I'm allowed to use your images for transformative and educational purposes under the fair use law. Good distribution maps on the internet are unfortunately pretty rare. So I constructed one based off records from the internet. Please keep in mind this is an unprofessionally made distribution map made in Microsoft Paint in a few minutes time. It does not 100% accurately portray their range, but instead it is a rough caricature of their range. It's partially accurate, but not very scientific. Telugures Resens is distributed through the Palearctic from most parts of <clears throat> mainland Europe, I apologize for coughing, all the way through Russia and to the Far East. In Europe, they were reported uh, in Austria, Belarus, Belgium, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the British Isles, France, Germany, Denmark, Spain, Italy, Corsica, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Russia, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Ukraine, Finland, France, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Switzerland, Sweden, Estonia and Yugoslavia. They can also be found all the way from west to east in Russia. They may also cross the border over Russia into parts of northern China or maybe even Korea. Some of my sources mention them in China, Korea and even Iran. Although I'm unsure of their exact distribution inside these countries. What's interesting about this species is that they prefer hot environments. Now you can take hot with a grain of salt, since they are from the northern hemisphere and temperate climates. Of course it's all relative, but even northern Europe and Russia can have microhabitats that are much warmer compared to their surroundings due to their landscape. This species is often found in sandy heathlands or chalk hills, dunes, forest clearings and open rocky terrains. These places are hot because rocky and open terrains and sandy soils absorb a lot of heat from the sun. 
Have you ever gone to the beach and almost burned your feet on a hot sand that was scorching hot from the sun? Exactly. Places with a lot of chalk rock or sand will retain more heat. And these are the types of microclimates that Telogures Resens often seems to prefer. It is not true that they prefer dry habitats, however, since they are also found in fens, bogs, swamps and humid deciduous woodlands. So what do the caterpillars love to eat in the wild? Turns out it's just about anything. Like many types of gypsy, vaporer and tussock moths, they are extremely polyphagous and feed on potentially hundreds of host plants. Frequently recorded are many types of dock or rumex, salix or willow, cutegus or hawthorn, taxaricum or dandelion, prunus or cherry, oak or quercus, erica or heather, vaccinium or blueberry, betula or birch and many more plants. In fact, they have so many host plants, it's not possible for me to list all of them in one slide. But these were some of the most significant ones. Interesting to know is that this species is day active or diurnal. Yes, the males are active during the day, under the influence of sunshine. This species has up to two generations a year. The caterpillars actually hibernate in larval form and seem to be able to face harsh frost and cold remaining inactive until spring. Only when it's spring the caterpillars become active again and resume feeding on various herbs and shrubs in their area. Then around late spring to early summer the caterpillars will cocoon. The cocoons hatch around June and July in most locations. The males locate almost wingless females by smell or pheromone. After pairing, females lay a few hundred eggs. These eggs hatch in two weeks time and a new generation of larvae is spawned. But what's really interesting is what happens next. Of the second generation a small amount of caterpillars decide to grow into moths the same year. But the majority of them don't and prefer to hibernate instead until next year. So to summarize it, the majority of eggs being laid and caterpillars being born in summer, only a small percentage of them will grow into the next generation of moths without hibernating. I guess this is what you can call a bimodal pattern in their breeding behavior. Even more interesting is that in captivity they will actually never hibernate if kept warm, proving their diapause is facultative and not obligate. Orgia recens is a species that is increasingly restricted to a small number of sites. For some reason the species appears to be struggling. In my country, the Netherlands, the species is classified as critically endangered. And even in Britain or the UK, if you prefer, the species has vanished from large parts of its original range. In some countries like Belgium, it has reportedly been vanished entirely. In fact, in the country of Belgium, where it used to be found in over seven provinces, the species has never been seen again since 1980. While digging around in literature, I wanted to understand the reasons for their decline. I found some reports from butterfly conservation, in this case the British Butterfly Conversa Conservation, that mentions, as the early stages and the adult female are always found on the food plant, this species can be uh, a threat from overzealous cutting or remo removal of hedgerows and other vegetation. The timing of rapid decline of the scarce vaporer has seemingly coincided with the development of mechanical flailing of hedgerows, at least within parts of its natural range. Drainage of its habitats is also a potential threat. Sites have been lost to landscaping and hedgerow removal, as well as peat and gravel extraction. On some sites, fragmentation of the moth's population has resulted in isolated colonies, these being more susceptible to accidental destruction. Hedgerow management. Hedgerows should be managed on a rotation of at least three years and care should be taken to avoid managing all the hedgerows on a site in one year. Where management is undertaken, this should be cut in sections or trimmed across the hedgerow. It turns out that for this species, it's important for the host plants in the landscape to be in close proximity to each other. It turns out that they spend all their lives on the host plant. Especially because the females are flightless, their ability to migrate is limited. Instead, this species tends to spread itself throughout shrubs, bushes and hedges that are interconnecting. 
They kind of spread directly from plant to plant if you think about it. However, the way humans like to manage the landscape is changing. For example, in agricultural pastures, it's less popular to keep shrub, trees and hedges around. Often flat pastures are on the increase. While it may be more beneficial for farmers, this is bad news for many species of moths and butterflies that survived in this type of vegetation. No trees and bushes means no space for other animals and plants. If we change the way we plan our landscape, we can save species like Telogurus recens from extinction. One good way would be for farmers to return hedgerows to their pastures and farmland. To allow for more interconnected spaces with trees and shrubs that provide shelters and pathways to many animals, including but not limited to butterflies and moths. Removing vegetation from the landscape is often detrimental. Meet Aporia kategi, the black-veined white, one of the biggest spirit butterflies found in Europe. Since 1925, this species has vanished and was never seen again in the British Isles. In my country, the Netherlands, the species used to be common, but went completely extinct and hasn't been recorded since 1975. And the reason? The removal of hedgerows. This species laid their eggs mainly on kategus or hawthorn. The removal of hedgerows from the landscape had devastating effects, such as their extinction from large parts of their range. The good news is that the species is not entirely extinct and is still common in some parts of Europe, such as Poland, parts of France and more, so there is a chance for recovery or reintroduction. But this will likely never happen if we stop the habitat degradation that allows this to happen. Yes, hedgerows are important for many butterflies and moths. Unfortunately, tiny moth species receive way less attention than big and showy species of butterflies. When it comes to conservation, species like Telogurus recens are often ignored, overlooked and hardly cared about. And that's a shame. I do hope this little YouTube episode will spread awareness about this wonderful but threatened species and inspires biologists to talk about them when it's relevant. I hope this species will not go extinct in most of Europe where it's rapidly declining. Something needs to be done. Something should be done about them being fragmented into tiny, vulnerable and isolated populations. The good news is that the species is found in vast areas of Russia, some of which are more untouched when it comes to vegetation. So if the species rapidly declines in Europe, they may always be pushed back into the eastern part of its range. But from a conservation perspective, their decline should be reason for concern for such a wonderful little moth. Brachypterism, or more frequently Brachypteri, is an anatomical condition in which an animal has very reduced wings. Such animals or their wings may be described as Brachypterus. Brachypterus wings are generally not functional as organs of flight and often seem to be totally functionless and vestigial. In moths, this phenomenon looks unusual, because in our mind we are used to the mental image of moths having functional wings. However, in reality there are examples of Brachypteri in numerous families of moths. Even large ones such as Lasiocampidae or leopard moths, or even a number of Saturnidae females or Emperor moths, Geometric moths or loopers, Arctinae or tiger moths and many more. Amazingly, it even happens in some species of butterflies. In several species of butterfly, in the genus Redonda for example, the females have wings that are so small that she is unable to fly. Essentially, all her life she can simply crawl on the floor while the males fly around trying to locate her. It may blow your mind to imagine butterflies that have lost their ability to fly. But it's not surprising if you think about how often it happens in over 35 families of Lepidopterans. Why are some females of butterflies and moths reduced to a walking abdomen? It's simply an evolutionary trade-off between flight capability and reproduction. First of all, having functional wings and a muscle mass to support these wings in flight costs energy. In fact, having any bodily function or organ in the first place costs energy. The absence of wings simply allows greater allocation of resources to eggs production. But we have to ask ourselves, in potentially what circumstances is laying more eggs an advantage over being able to fly? The answer to that is a habitat in which you don't need to disperse. That's right. 
is not just resource allocation, but also habitat persistence is one of the important factors that make brachypteri an adaptive advantage. In stable habitats where the species can reproduce without an urgent need for dispersal, there is less selective pressure when it comes to functional wings in females. In a very stable habitat, there is less incentive for them to cover larger distances or migrate, sacrificing flight capability for a higher reproductive rate and better resource allocation towards egg laying may, may, more, may make more sense. Worldwide there are quite a lot of species of vapor moths. There is a chance that if you live in the USA or Europe you have seen some of them. The moths are small and often overlooked but they have really wonderful looking caterpillars. Here's a challenge for you. If you ever find some of them, try and raise them in captivity and see what happens. Some species are really common, but others can be rare and are rarely studied by biologists. I'm a fan of these creatures myself. Hopefully we will see more vaporers on this channel in the future. You don't have to give me anything. You don't have to give me anything. You don't have to give me anything. I appreciate you for simply being here and enjoying my videos. That means a lot to me. In the past few months, I have been crowdfunding a lot on this channel. I'm always fundraising. And the only reason I do that is because I'm demonetized and it's simply how I survive, how this channel survives. But I think sometimes it's important to take a break, to not always ask people for more and more, but also to stop and smell the roses. And I just want to take this moment to say that you, all of you guys really have my gratitude for being here, for watching my videos, for commenting on my videos. And I also want you to know that I appreciate everybody who watches this channel. You really don't have to give me anything in order for me to appreciate you. This channel has changed my life radically. And I, I'm not just talking about money. I'm also talking in terms of things like friendship. I've met so many new people on uh, through this channel. I've made so many new friends through this channel. I have my own community with people I talk to every day. And I think these kind of friendships are worth more than money. And I just want you guys to know that I appreciate each and every one of you. Collectively, all of you have changed my life for the better. Uh, I feel like I am a more confident person. Uh, I feel like I am a more social person. I, am, I feel very loved because of all of you, because of your nice comments, your supportive comments on this channel. And it doesn't have to cost you any money. And I just wanted to I just wanted to get this across because lately the thing is that it's hard to always be occupied with the crowdfunding. It gets tiresome. It's kind of annoying. I wish I didn't have to do it myself. And that's just the result of me being demonetized. But I don't want to be that guy who is never satiated or never satisfied with what he has. Because let me tell you, I generally have a lot. You guys are already giving me a lot and you, you don't necessarily have to give me more. The only reason I'm doing that is because I'm ambitious. I'm always trying to grow the channel bigger. And for that it's very simple. For that I require budget. But I just wanted to know, to say to all of you guys that really you don't have to give me money for me to appreciate you and the fact that you are here. People liking my videos, people commenting under my videos. But simply people engaging with me, having fun with me, sharing enjoyment, sharing the entertainment and our passion for nature and seeing some of the crazy things I upload on my channel sometimes to have a laugh. To me, that's really valuable and I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. So uh, I just wanted to get it off my chest. I know today is a very different message than from my other videos, but I feel like I should be the one thanking you guys and um, I'm really happy for you know the amount of support that I already have. It's really amazing. 
And uh, I don't want to never want to give anyone the impression that it's not enough for me or that I always need more and more. Uh, what I have is already enough, believe me, it really is. So, and uh, yeah, that's, that's really what I want to say today. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for changing me. Thank you for supporting and encouraging me to open up, to be myself. I would never have thought that I would have this community full of people that are engaging with me on a daily basis. It's really crazy. Like five, six years ago, I was this lonely, lonely kid on, uh, on the internet with a camera that's really into moths. And I still am. I am still that... Well, I'm still that enthusiastic kid. I'm no longer that lonely kid because uh, I don't really feel lonely at all, thanks to you guys. So, and uh, I feel like this is the start of a big movement, you know. Insects, we really need more people to care about insects. In a world where insects are declining so much, so much species going extinct, being threatened. So it's very nice to discover that there is actually a market, that there is a target audience for people who do care, for people that are enthusiastic about insects. It makes me feel less alone and it gives me hope. It gives me hope because there, there apparently there are thousands of other peoples like me. And I would never have imagined that. And that is also really valuable. That's really my message for today. I'm not going to promote anything. I'm not going to ask for anything today. I'm just saying thank you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for being so supportive. Really, it means the fucking world to me. It really does. And I hope you guys will enjoy this video and all the other videos that I've been working on. So, uh, there's that. Love all of you. Bye bye.